discussion of modern journalism, especially magazine journalism, is complete, I believe, without a discussion of the new, new journalism. Your book talks about the journal, new journalism of the 19th century in the 1800s when there was a breakthrough with investigative work and stories that looked critically at the government. Uh, we had a similar breakthrough, I believe, in the very late 60s, early 70s with a type of new journalism. Some of the names of the writers you'll recognize, Hunter S. Thompson is still uh, someone that I think a lot of young people identify with. Uh, we've lost Truman Capote and we've lost Norman Mailer, but their impact on the field still lasts today. Joan Didion, uh, Tom Wolfe continues to write today, Gay Talese. That group of young writers really broke a lot of the traditional conventions of journalism at the time and set a whole new stage for a new kind of writing that still resonates with us today. I think sometimes uh, because it is so recent we may not realize how much impact it's really had. One of the things that was so different about this crop of young journalists was that they injected themselves into the stories quite frequently. We all know that Hunter S. Thompson was often the star of his own dramas as he made his way in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. He started his early career, um, I mean, he was periodically a sports writer and was at the end of his life, but one of the books that he wrote early on in his career was his time with the Hells Angels. That's when, uh, as a reporter, he immersed himself so much in that culture, he actually suffered a very serious beating by the angels after he left that organization and wrote the book about them. But he immersed himself in the subject and he talked about his own experiences. So you could filter whatever he was telling you through the experiences as he told them to you in real time. It was a very first person, very immediate kind of journalism. Also quite controversial, of course, because he talked about his own drug use along the way and that was really a startling departure from the past. If it hadn't been for the creation of the magazine Rolling Stone with Jan Wenner, it's debatable whether Hunter Thompson would have ever had the career he did because Rolling Stone gave him a platform for that kind of writing. There simply hadn't been magazines willing to do that before. Another thing that was very different about this new journalism was that these writers were using literary devices to try to tell nonfiction stories. They would use imagery, the very vivid images. They would use all kinds of verbal tricks and alliteration, things that you would see from poetry, for example. Tom Wolfe wrote a book, and it's now a collection of his essays. It wasn't a book, it was a collection of his essays. And it was called Candy Colored Tangerine Flake Streamline Baby. And that comes from an article that he wrote in the Esquire magazine. And I'll have to read the words very carefully because I don't have them committed to, min to memory. But the title of that magazine article was There goes, vroom vroom, that candy colored tangerine flake streamline baby rah, around the bend. Brum, 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 brum. And he did that title with all of the made up words in between to try to emulate sounds. It was one of the longer magazine titles ever recorded, I assume. But that was a startling departure from the kind of very serious and proper journalism that we saw in the past. Um, journalists took themselves very seriously and now all of a sudden we had this new crop of young writers willing to be a bit more playful, a bit more uh, challenging the status quo. They used other techniques. Uh, one of the things we know about books, that books allow you to tell people things that are going on in people's minds. You know, that intrapersonal communication, our own thoughts that occur in our head. You know, film, we can maybe see what happens in a person's face, but we don't find out what's going on in their mind unless they have a narrated section of the movie. Um, we think of a movie like Blade Runner where Harrison Ford narrated parts of it. They took that out later because they felt that, that the director's cut, they took that out because the director felt it actually detracted from the story. But when you read a book, you find out what's in a person's head. And that's what new journalism of the 70s did. This young crop of writers started talking about what was in their own heads, their thoughts, their impressions of what they saw. That also led them to do things that were extremely controversial. In fact, they remain controversial to this day. They would invent dialogue on occasion, or they would tell you what the other person was thinking. You know, they would see the expression on somebody's face and they would imagine what was going on in that person's head as they interviewed them. Even though this was supposed to be a non-fiction magazine article, something that was telling you the truth, 
They were willing to make that intellectual leap and tell you, based on the person's reaction or expression, what it was that they must have been thinking. And boy, did that get them into hot water with a lot of the prevailing journalism schools and journalists who had been trained never, ever to speculate about something like that, even if it looks pretty obvious. But that's the kind of analysis that I think many of us have grown used to seeing in a lot of our journalism. It's, it's crept into newspaper journalism and not just magazine journalism. The use of those literary devices, I believe, are part of the reason that beginning in the 70s we saw nonfiction become a very important part of the book market in a way that it hadn't been before. Uh, the generation from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the talented young writers grew up wanting to write fiction. They wanted to write the great American novel. But after this crop of young writers got together, many of them decided that they wanted to write that very important first-person account. Um, you know, there's that quote from Hunter S. Thompson that when the going gets tough, the weird turn pro. And by that, I think he meant a lot of things that were taboo subjects from the past were things that now young writers were writing about. They would write about sex. They would write about drugs. They would write about rock and roll and uh, all sorts of taboo subjects that hadn't been around before. They used humor. They used plain, all sorts of playfulness in their writing. If we look back at some of the primary examples of these writers who broke the mold, I think in terms of books, we have to give credit to Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, um, very important work of what he called uh, the nonfiction novel. He used novelistic techniques to tell the story about the murder of the Clutter family by two drifters. He got to know those two young men very well and actually was uh, um, writing about them at a time when they were put to death and I, I think it probably had a profound impact on Capote his whole life. Um, he and his good friend author Harper Lee often talked about these stories. Many people feel that she influenced his writing quite strongly in this area with some of the literary techniques that she used. Uh, pieces of the public of the book were published elsewhere as it began as the novel began to come out. It was considered a groundbreaking departure to use these kind of techniques. And he definitely did immerse himself in the story, in the story of these two young drifters who were arrested, arrested for those murders. Another author from that era was Norman Mailer, the late Norman Mailer, who was always wanting to write the great American novel. He had written his novel about World War II, and um, that's the book famous for using fug all the way through it because they wouldn't let him use the real world word in print. And uh, Mailer decided at a certain point that journalism was something that he wanted to do, and he also published the nonfiction novel that was called The Armies of the Night which was looking at a lot of the protests and the um, kinds of things that were happening in the 70s as the anti-war movement took shape, and he was deeply immersed in that movement. Esquire magazine hired him and a number of other young writers like Terry Southern, and they had them cover the Chicago Convention of 1968 as well. And they really were part of that whole chaos that occurred, the police riot that occurred in Chicago when the, um, the 1968 Democratic Convention outside the convention hall, the hippies and the yippies were meeting in Grant Park and the police took after them. There was very dramatic writing about those uh, experiences that was then published in Esquire magazine following this. And it really was the beginning of POV, point of view writing, which was different than the kinds of journalism that we'd seen before. There was a whole clutch of magazines that began looking for these kinds of young writers who could write these pieces. Uh, Esquire magazine was very famous. Rolling Stone magazine was very famous for this. There was a new magazine that came along under editor Clay Felker, and it was New York Magazine. And they ran Tom Wolfe's article called The Me Decade, where he talked about how we were becoming as a culture a much more self-centered kind of people taking a look at ourselves in a new way, uh, writing these kinds of trend pieces and analysis pieces where writers tried to explain the zeitgeist, sort of the spirit of the times. Milton Glaser was the designer for New York Magazine. He was also famous for creating posters for Bob Dylan. He also created that very famous I Love New York slogan with the heart that everybody knows. He was a breakthrough designer. So what you saw were this new generation of photojournalists, new journalists, designers, trying to create a new way of communicating stories about the times using the kinds of techniques that had never been used in that kind of journalism before. And I think that still resonates with a lot of us today. Maybe one of the inheritors of that mantle that many of you may know is a writer called Matt Taibbi. 
He writes for Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone is still around. It may be thinner and smaller than the old tabloid version back from the 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, but in this era, Rolling Stone is taking a look at some of the serious issues of the time using investigative techniques again. But Matt Taibbi is that new generation of writers who's sort of the inheritor of the mantle of Hunter S. Thompson. Um, he's one of the few where things that he writes actually get quoted, like song lyrics get quoted. People have memorized some of the lines. He wrote an article about the financial crisis and took a look at Goldman Sachs. And here's what he said about Goldman Sachs that many people have committed to memory and actually use this quote uh, from their own memory banks. That he called Goldman Sachs the world's most powerful investment bank is a great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Um, similes, metaphors, char colorful characterizations of uh, the activities of a financial investment bank like Goldman Sachs aren't exactly the traditional kinds of business writing that we expect. But it conveys vivid imagery that's the kind of line you're not going to forget. And it's uh, very interesting because in subsequent interviews, Taibbi has talked about the fact that the fact checkers now at Rolling Stone gave him a hard time because apparently these giant squid don't really have a blood funnel, or at least not that they could find. And he said it doesn't matter. It's imagery. We're trying to create a vivid picture whether it exists in nature or not. So these are the kinds of journalism that push the boundaries, that make some people uncomfortable because they presuppose or suppose what other people are thinking and what their expressions mean, and they speculate quite a bit. But it's a liberating kind of journalism, and I think its impact on making writing more colorful, more engaging, is part of what we see with blogging nowadays. We see many writers who are sort of the inheritors of that new journalism mantle. In fact, I would call them the new, new, new journalists, who are out there writing very careful, colorful point of view pieces that include a lot of these uh, fascinating techniques that I think help bring journalism into a whole new era.